I think we're up. All right. So you may start now. Nice Ready to see to go. everybody again. Thank you uh, for <laughs> joining us here on Facebook Live for another little bit of uh, a guide to greater living, we hope. I'm Don Scott. I'm Mary Beth Marsden, and today we're going to be talking about something really, really interesting, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that's changed over a lot of years, and bigger changes yet to come, and that is uh, genetic testing. Not only genetic testing, but all kinds of genetics, and genetic counseling, and who it affects, and we're not just talking about prenatal testing, we're talking about postnatal, we're talking yes. about teenagers who also get tested uh, genetically, so just, and what it all means. Mm -hmm. And we have two great guests from GBMC, Dr. Natalie Blagovodov um, and Amy Kimball, who's a genetic counselor. Thank you both uh, so much for being with us, but we should mention that uh, Dr. Blagovodov is the Prenatal Diagnostic Center at GBMC. She's the director and also the director for the Harvey Institute for Human Genetics. And um, gosh, I'm so, um, we're fixing a little, we'll have a little microphone here. Is it not on? No, it's not. Okay, well, so good thing we haven't asked the question yet. <laughs> we'll this will give you time to think. I'll tell you we'll what, I'm gonna throw a question out there. <laughs> and both Don and I were talking about genetics and what we remember from our experiences. And, you know, both being in the news, I can tell you we've had so many stories over the years about uh, research and what's been discovered and the human genome, and it's really mind-blowing. Right, it is, and now for prenatal um, diagnostics, which Amy and I are both involved in, uh, the amount of testing that we can offer um, expectant parents has just exploded over the years compared to when I started in the field. Um, so we offer testing for both um, testing the baby and looking with ultrasound and with various blood tests, looking for different um, disorders, chromosomal abnormalities, looking for hereditary conditions. Um, but in addition to those tests, which we can go into a little bit more, um, we can also test the parents um, themselves. So I'll just add that a while back, it used to be those who were deemed high risk, whether family history, whether they were a parent over 35, would be sent for testing and counseling. But now we have these genetic tests that are offered to just everyone who's pregnant, whether they're 20, 30, 40, um, things like carrier screening to see if they might carry a genetic condition like cystic fibrosis, but the list of things we can test for are into the 200s. And does, do you tell the parents from the beginning, would mm -hmm. the parents to be, that they're being tested, or is it just part of the normal procedure now? Absolutely, the patient should be informed, they should be able to make choices, they should be able to decide, is this information we want? Do we, would we want to know this information now, or is it just going to overwhelm us? Is it going to cause us anxiety during the pregnancy? And thankfully, most of the time, we're providing reassurance, but it's absolutely a discussion with that family, that couple, so that they can make informed choices. Because I remember, again, in our past, uh, 30 years ago, something like that, when they went beyond ultrasound, you kind of went, why? You know, why? Is there something wrong? Mm -hmm. Was something wrong with the ultrasound? Is that where stuff shows up in the beginning? Um, ultrasound has also come a long way, and it certainly it sure has. Uh, right. <laughs> you <laughs> right. see, like, the whole kid, uh, you know? Exactly. I think um, years ago, I know when I was pregnant and had an ultrasound, and, you know, and then I'd show people the picture, and they would go, oh, is that the leg or that's the face? <laughs> I would just agree with everybody, but yeah. really, um, it, it was a Isn't fuzzy little picture. <laughs> um, and nowadays, the details we can see, we can look and see a four-chamber heart at 11 weeks of pregnancy. We can see amazing things, but you're right that will also identify maybe something that early on that will be concerning and lead to additional testing. Um, but there's testing we can do without ultrasound just to um, research and look into looking for problems in the pregnancy. I think we should mention too that we have a studio audience yes, here with us and I'm looking out and I'm thinking that most of you have probably some grown children, right? Maybe even grandchildren. So this is really valuable information for your generations uh, to come. And um, and also for all the people who are watching us right now on Facebook, uh, we have uh, the all kinds of ages watching, mm -hmm. people who are thinking about having children. And this is something to think about now too, um, no matter what your age, if you're thinking about having children, this is these are the kinds of things that are running through your head. And I have to say, when you first start broaching that topic, it can be scary. Yeah. It's, I think it's very overwhelming for families, the amount of tests that they can do, understanding what they mean. I would urge a family who's thinking about start 
a couple thinking about starting a family to start the dialogue with their OB even before they conceive. What kind of testing can I do now? What kind of reassurance can I gain even before we start trying to get pregnant? I know everybody today arranges things, including yes. when they're going to give birth to their child and things. But so uh, yeah, best it, of luck with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to work in a couple of cases. I know, but not personally. But uh, let's say somebody's thinking about having a child. Should they immediately come to the genetic genetic center and begin testing? Really, they don't need to see us um, primarily, but go to, as Amy said, to your own obstetrician, gynecologist. They can suggest a test that um, there are limited tests you can that are recommended by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology that all people considering getting pregnant should do um, screening for very common um, disorders, and also to get your health and to the best shape as it can be. If you're diabetic, you want to make sure your glucose levels are normal. If you're on medication, do you need to be on those two medications because you have a seizure problem? Maybe you can be on one medication, that sort of thing. So that your general doctor can do. But then once um, testing becomes, um, once a test may be abnormal, or if in talking with your doctor there's a family history that suggests that there's a problem, that's the time to come and see us already, even before pregnancy. And certainly I know Amy's definitely seen a number of couples um, preconception. Right, so sometimes families um, will come because they want to have what we call carrier testing, where we send a saliva sample or a blood sample to check a number of genes that are recessive where you can be a carrier and have no idea because you're perfectly healthy, but if both parents are carriers, they could have a child with that condition. And I mentioned cystic fibrosis again because it's just one of the common ones, but the list goes on. And this is information that they can obtain prior to even conceiving. And we can say, you're not a carrier for any of the conditions on the panel, your risk is very, very low, or indeed you are at risk for having a pregnancy with such and such condition, and then go from there. I, I'm gonna ask a question. I, we're gonna get very specific about testing and exactly what it all means and, and what specific tests there are now, but just to, on the broader sense, do you have any idea percentage-wise how many um, expectant parents or planning to be parents actually do get tested? Because I. It is my sense that the majority aren't thinking in those terms unless there's some kind of red flag in their family they already know about mm -hmm. or their age has become a factor. Would you agree? You know, or is it becoming more commonplace, I guess is I my question. I think it's becoming more commonplace. I think b between social media and whatnot, I think it's becoming commonplace. I think we see a very biased population because everyone who makes it to our office is motivated to do testing. So there's plenty of families who never even get to our office. Um, or they do the screening through their OB and everything is reassuring and they don't end up coming to see us. I hear you saying screening and testing. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the same thing? So. <laughs> so no screening and testing is not exactly the same, although I think Amy could explain it very well. Um, um, so screening is you're just looking, you know, is there an increased risk for this problem? So one of the tests that we've done for many years is alpha fetal protein, and that's still recommended around 16 weeks of pregnancy. That's a screening test. If that blood level is high in the mother, higher risk for um, the baby to have a birth defect such as spina bifida. But it's a screening test. It certainly doesn't mean the baby has spina bifida. Then we can do a more diagnostic test, which used to be doing an amniocentesis and looking at the amniotic fluid for that alpha fetal protein and other biochemicals. But just your point from earlier, that ultrasound from many years ago, eh, nowadays I feel very confident that we can do a detailed ultrasound and um, to really evaluate the spine. And, and you don't have to do an normal. amnio? Not anymore for spina bifida. Wow. So, yeah, the imaging has just gotten terrific. I was witness to an amniocentesis, and it was fascinating for right. the man to watch. Yeah, my husband almost fainted. <laughs> yeah. And that's a diagnostic <laughs> test. That's the um, you know definite answer. Sure. You'll see those chromosomes as opposed to doing a blood test, which will just give you an idea. And apparently, we have an audience question. Yeah, Great. we actually have uh, two audience questions. Here's the first one: Are the over-the-counter DNA tests like 23andMe mm. and Ancestry uh, worth the money? What do they tell us, and are they accurate? Mm -hmm. Did you, want to do that? Um, you know, I haven't heavily explored 23andMe, but I think the limitation is 
interpreting those results. So who's explaining those results to the person who's doing it? When they get those results, do they, are they really going to understand what that means for their health? If a family comes to me and they said, oh, I did 23andMe and I'm a carrier for such and such condition, I usually repeat it at a clinical lab that we have um, good experience with and I don't really even pay attention to their 23andMe results. So I think it's something that, um, I, I, th I think it, you have to think about, will you be able to understand what your results mean? Yeah, and I have to agree with Amy. I actually, well, I'll agree and disagree. I'll disagree a little bit. I do think they're fairly reliable, and actually 23andMe has gotten so many people to send them blood samples that they are very involved now in research and offering those blood samples for research. So that is a good positive sort of spin from them. But I've definitely had friends contact me. They couldn't understand the report. Um, things were unearthed that they had no interest in looking for, and it gets very confusing. So I don't really recommend it just to send off just out of curiosity. And then the inherit the heritability looking at your ethnic background, it's fairly reliable, and that's just for fun. So you can certainly do it. Um, it it's not a problem. In fact, I thought that DNA test was just for fun. R and that from that level, it's fine, yeah. I, I, would you be worried? I'm just wondering if you got a, a false positive, I, I guess, wouldn't be as worrisome as a false negative. Um, would you be worried that something serious wouldn't come out in one of these tests and someone would just move on maybe making family planning um, a priority with just using this test and then have a surprise down the road. Is that too far flung? Yeah, no, we both agree. Yeah. yeah. I think um, I'll just use a scenario. If one partner knows they're a carrier for cystic fibrosis and the other one had testing through 23andMe and it was negative and they felt reassured, that might be completely legitimate, but how? what is the detection rate of carriers for the 23andMe test? Do they catch every carrier? Do they miss 10% of carriers? So does that couple understand that this doesn't rule out cystic fibrosis? I think the other side of it is if it comes back positive for cardiovascular disease risk, it's understanding, well, what? how much does that increase your risk? Does it increase it dramatically? Does it increase it by a small percentage? And so understanding what a positive really means. Okay, I think we had another audience question. Yes, um, this question is genetic testing generally covered by insurance? <laughs> we thought that question might come up and <laughs> Amy got assigned to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> so it's variable. Um, I think that most insurance companies have policies for genetic testing. I think that when we use this term genetic testing, there are so many things that fall under in that category. There could be testing for Down syndrome during pregnancy. There could be carrier screen that we've talked about. There could be testing for cancer genes. And every insurance company has different criteria for what they will pay for in certain circumstances. And Oftentimes, as a genetic counselor, that's part of our job is helping navigate that for the family. I think sometimes things are covered, but families have large deductibles, and genetic testing as a whole tends to be very expensive. So there's no, there's no straight answer for that. But as a whole, I think insurance companies are doing a very good job. Can I ask a stickier question to go with that a little bit? So when you talk about insurance, um, there's all kinds of concerns with privacy, and concerns about pre-existing conditions and how that will be interpreted by insurance companies. Um, knowledge that, that comes from genetic testing that now what do you do with that knowledge? Do you want an insurance company to even know about it? And um, those kinds of questions I'm sure are pretty prominent, maybe not in prenatal but in other kinds of testing. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a question that we don't really address often in prenatal, but I know our genetic counselor who works with families in the cancer realm, that's a question that comes up all the time because families might be talk thinking about life insurance and such like that. There are laws in place that are supposed to protect people from bias based on genetic testing. But just what Amy said, um, so yes, you're protected medically, like you can still get health insurance if you're found to have a genetic condition currently. 
the law protects you from that, but it does not protect you from the insurance industry saying, oh, but look, you have this genetic condition, we're not going to insure you. So there is that limitation, um, and that's like life insurance, not health insurance. That okay, so far, we've to. talked about blood tests, we've talked about uh, ultrasound and amniocentesis, which you used to do. What follows ultrasound now if somebody needs further testing? What kind of tests are we talking about? Yeah, no, amniocentesis hasn't completely gone away, but I guess chorionic villus sampling, where you can do testing between 10 and 12 weeks of pregnancy, it's been around for a while now, so you can have earlier invasive testing if you're going to do that. But nowadays, we don't do too much of amnio or chorionic villus sampling. There's a, when we're screening for chromosome abnormalities, we're doing something called NIPS, which is a blood test, looking at little fragments of DNA breaking off from the placenta, getting into the mother's bloodstream, and finding these wow. just a few fragments um, circulating around. And if there's just a few more of a particular chromosome, that could be detected. So it's amazing technology. So I remember a time when genetic testing was rather limited and you could only really test for a handful of things. Could you tick down some of the things that you actually can test for and are they definitive? So if you, you said certain chromosomes show up or certain abnormalities show up, is that a percentage that that will be passed on to the newborn or is it a definitive is it a definitive, yes, this will. This is what it is? Right, so with the invasive test of chorionic villus sampling or amnio, it's a definitive, we can get a definitive answer. With this blood test, um, it really varies how accurate it is. Um, it, de detection for Down syndrome is over 99%. Detection for actually diseases caused by smaller pieces of chromosome, five, 10 percent What that means is somebody who would get a positive result from that blood test only one out of the 10 people will really have a baby with that problem. So it's not a perfect test. Back in, in my experience with amniocentesis, there was a great emphasis from the doctor's part to our part to something could go wrong with the pregnancy because we're doing this test. Are there risks still involved in invasive testing? Yeah, no, there's still a risk. I think just with the better ultrasound, the risk has gotten smaller, but there is a risk of miscarriage from either of those procedures. And I think that's why these days, many people do the blood screening test and are satisfied that if that test comes back reassuring and the ultrasound looks good, they're not doing invasive testing. This question's probably in Amy's wheelhouse. I'm sure in yours too, but definitely in yours. Um, so when you get the results, and then parents are given this, or, 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 or expectant mothers or whoever it is, are given this information, and they're left with something that could be really hard to digest and figure out, and they have decisions to make. What is the safety net for them through you guys? I mean, do you counsel people beyond the results and what it means and work with them, and are, are there places for them to go? Yeah, I mean, I, when we give, it's an emotional thing, I guess, yes. is my point, right? Yeah, and I think one of the things I love about being part of the GBMC team is that we have the ability to have multiple interactions with families who are going through getting a diagnosis, figuring out what this means, figuring it out how it's going to affect their family, what it's going to mean for that child after delivery, and even make decisions about the pregnancy and how they're going to manage the pregnancy. Um, you'll meet Dr. Klein and Marsha, but we can transition into our, with our pediatric geneticists very easily. We have weekly meetings where we talk about the patients that we're following and when they're delivering, and they can meet Dr. Klein before delivery. So we try to educate them. We try to provide emotional support. We try to be available for them. Sometimes it's hard. They don't have any other resource. Their OB can't always answer the questions that they need answered. And just helping them navigate through the whole process. And in this day and age, do people say no to any form of genetic testing, if you were, if, even though it's recommended? They're, they're kind of like, I don't want to know. Absolutely. And when families are referred to our office and meet with Marsha or myself and they're sent for Down syndrome screening, the first thing I ask them is, is this something that you want? Is this something that you feel you need? Because there's always the option not to do screening. And I think our goal is to make sure whatever choices they're making, are they're informed and they're the right choice for them. Can you talk about some of the, um, specifically, some of the syndromes, some of the diseases, some of, 
um, whatever it is that you're testing, what are actual names of some of the things that you test positive for uh, with a um, high per percentage rate of Oh, accuracy? with a high percentage rate, again, the chromosome abnormalities are more common, so the same things we screened four years Such ago, as? something like Down syndrome okay. or trisomy 13 or 18. But I have to say, sort of one that's come up recently is spinomuscular atrophy is a disorder where there's a very severe muscle weakness to the point that if you have the severe form um, in the old days, a couple of years ago, um, you would die from the disorder in uh, the first two years of life quite often. Um, but it's been recommended that this disease be screened for in order to get better medical help um, and attention early and also to know about it because it's such a severe disorder. Well, recently, just a few months ago, gene therapy came along, and so individuals diagnosed with this disorder are now getting treated um, in their first few months of life, so knowing about the diagnosis is very helpful to get immediate treatment and then and doing much better. So the screening can lead to better care um, down the road. It's, it's just amazing. So that's, that's what we always hope for with all of these diseases as they've come along. I remember cystic fibrosis was identified um, the gene sort of in the 1990s, and we really hoped that we would have then very specific genetic treatments and um, for people to do a lot better with cystic fibrosis. And it slowly happened, but it yeah, depends a little bit they on say which they're getting mutation so close, you right? have. Right, so if you have this mutation, we've got a great medicine for you with cystic fibrosis. Oh, you have that kind of cystic fibrosis? Okay, we can give you support, but we don't quite have the perfect medicine yet. Because how wonderful would it be for you to be able to do this testing, find something, and then tell people, but there is a treatment. There right. is plenty of hope. There is help. That's, exactly. kind of, that's the trifecta, right? I mean, that's right. The we would ultimate. love to be able to do right. that. And we can occasionally now in some cases, and in some cases, unfortunately, we can't. But at least we can give people information so that um, the expectant parents can be either prepared or make decisions about the pregnancy that um, helps them. Is, so, there, is there a misconception about genetic testing that you run into often? Oh. <laughs> but, you know, not necessarily. Okay. I, think, I think one of our goals that we're discussing every day is screening is not 100%. It's not diagnostic. It's not telling us anything definite. It's either indicating a low risk or a high risk. So I think that's sometimes where the misconception is. I think we have a question from the audience, right, or one or two? Yeah, we have a question from Howard. In the, uh, given the increased incidence of autism in younger children these days, is there a, a, a set of tests that you would perform to help determine that before a child is born? We don't have any testing or a testing panel that we do for that before a child is born, but hopefully you'll be here for the next half hour and we can talk a little <laughs> bit about the autism testing that we can do once a child has come along. Um, yeah, I think I'll defer There's to the There's a lot of research on it, but they just on haven't that really been start, able. Yeah. When you yeah. look at this, or do, you, do you want to comment on that? Um, when we're talking about carrier screening, identifying parents who carry a genetic condition that it could pass on. One of the conditions on that panel is something called Fragile X Syndrome, and probably in the population, about one in 450 women are carriers, and it's X-linked, so women can be unaffected carriers, but they could pass it on, and they pass it on to a son, he would have Fragile X, and individuals with Fragile X have intellectual disability, they have autism, and our carrier screening has um, included Fragile X over the last couple of years. So we're identifying women who are indeed at risk of having an affected child. It, that is, Fragile X is not contributing to the increased incidence of autism, but it is one of the common genetic forms that we can check for. Is there anything specific to this population in the Baltimore area where you find certain uh, genetic issues crop up? No, there really isn't. I mean, um, we the Mennonite community, for example, that isn't too far away, they're known to have certain um, genetic conditions. The Ashkenazi Jewish population yes, yes. um, will have higher risk for certain conditions. But if you put all of Baltimore together, like a lot of the United States, it's such a we melting pot. We run the gamut. Pot. Yeah, you got everything. How about age of parents? 
uh, how prevalent is that become? I mean, that's kind of one of the main reasons for people, I think, to get tested. Is that right? Correct? That was, as Amy was saying, nowadays everybody is offered testing, but certainly traditionally um, we knew that as women get older that there's an increased risk for these extra chromosome abnormalities like Down syndrome or trisomy um, 13 or 18, very severe disorders. Um, as you get older, you're more likely to have a child with one of those abnormalities and so um, with one of those conditions. Well, so, and are we seeing older women? All the time. Yeah. We have many patients over the age of 43 even um, having children. Is there a baseline age when you, for a woman, a mother-to-be, that you would urge her to, to do testing? Again, we offer testing to all all comers, all ages. The traditional age um, in the United States um, is age 35, just arbitrarily. That's where the curve sort of takes off for these increased risk for the chromosome issues. But I always like to tell people I went to an international conference, and in France it's age 38, so you can be younger for oh, three years. <laughs> the <laughs> French, of course. There we go. <laughs> Do you scoff at the idea of people who accuse uh, people who are doing genetic research or genetic testing of trying to to create the perfect human being that they worry that will make decisions about um, having children based on what these tests say? You, you know where I'm yeah. going, right? Right. There is no way to be perfect. We have, we're all full of lots of mutations and, you know, you can find one and, and there is um, the ability now to actually use something that's called CRISPR technique where you can actually chop a little piece of the gene out and put a, fix it and put another gene in. But there's the one right down the road that's abnormal. So there's no way to, even though we seek perfection in all of ourselves, <laughs> there's no way to do it genetically. Yeah. Where are we going down the road? I mean, how fast is the technology moving and is the science and the research moving? I mean, are you, every month, are you hearing something new, reading a new periodical? Every year, we actually have a different test. I mean, how fast is this going? Um, in, so in the prenatal world, the things that we can screen a pregnancy for has jumped dramatically even in the last couple of years. This new non-invasive prenatal screen that was really derived to screen for Down syndrome, and we've been doing it for about six years now. In the last year or two, now it's testing for even more chromosome conditions or testing for things like dwarfism and other kinds of genetic diseases that we're not necessarily routinely using, but it is growing so quickly what we can test for that it's even overwhelming for us as clinicians to think, okay, who, do, who am I going to offer this test to? Should I be offering it? Is it a valid test? And in what circumstance is it appropriate? We only have a few minutes left, and I think we want to get in another audience question. Actually, we got two audience questions based on testing. The first one is, does this testing lead to more termination of pregnancies mm -hmm. even if there is only a slight chance of development of abnormality found. And then the other question that's also testing based but uh, on a different subject matter is other than the BRCA gene, is there any other testing available for breast cancer? Um, I'll start with the second question. There's a lot of cancer, a lot of genes that have been implicated in breast cancer and I think if you have worries about cancer, I would highly recommend seeing a genetic counselor who specializes in cancer. Um, we have one at GBMC, and that person would help navigate which genes would be appropriate based on your personal history or family history of cancer. Um, your first question, I'm not necessarily sure if the rate of termination has changed, but one of the things that's very important is making sure families are educated between a, a definite diagnosis versus a high risk of a condition. So educating families, again, so that they can make informed decisions is very, very crucial and very, very important. And people do terminate? Yes, yeah, some people certainly do terminate their pregnancies, but I think we're able to give people you know, more and more information about conditions, expectations, um, for what would life be like with an individual with this um, condition, and so people can make a good decision. So it's not just the knowledge, it's what to do with the knowledge. Right, to help them. Yeah. It was fascinating. Yes. Thank you so much for being with Dr. Natalie Blagovidoff and Amy Kimball. Um, just really interesting, and thank you so much for those great questions.